Hi everyone, Storm Anderson here from Kumo Partners, and I am excited to introduce today our Kumo Innovation Academy. We've been collecting years of experience working on the Power Platform and Dynamics, and we've worked with organizations of all sizes, whether that's a mom and pop shop looking to develop an app to help their business be more performant, or working with an enterprise to roll out a solution for thousands of users across multiple countries. These patterns have come together and have allowed us to really develop these trainings with everyone in mind at the end of the day. And so here at Kumo, we actually have everyone on the delivery team learn and go through these courses. That includes, of course, the developer, the architect, but also includes the QA specialist, uh, the business analyst, and even the project manager. What this establishes is really a common language for everyone to be able to work together, especially when you start to think about what a fusion team means and how you get the most value when you have the people that know the business coming together with the people that know the technology. And so from all everyone taking these courses, we've really seen collaboration significantly increase because now everyone can play a part and work together more efficiently. We've seen the examples of a QA specialist now understanding now how to go into a Canvas app and look at the monitoring session and point out exactly why this button fails and what were the steps that led up to it. We have project managers that now know how to go into Power Automate and go through different flow runs and pinpoint exactly for a developer this is when this flow failed and what was some of the situation that happened as you can look live at each step of that flow. All of this is coming together to create a more cohesive team that knows how to work on the Power Platform and derive the most value out of it. So for our first course, we start with Canvas App Fundamentals. This is actually where a lot of us started here at Kumo Partners. And so we thought it best to really share uh, let's take away the complexity that comes about with integrating with data sources, building your application in different environments, deploying that. All of that we'll save for later. Let's just start with learning how to develop an app right from the ground up. And so this course is designed for everyone from beginners looking to just get started from scratch, or even if you have a couple of years experience, I think you'll find some patterns and practices that might actually really surprise you and really make your life a little bit easier. So with that, I hope you enjoy. Today, we're going to jump into one of our labs that we take everyone through here at Kumo Partners. And what this one really focuses on is hardcore, or at least I should say, very focused on Canvas app development. And so it is an intro course. We do try and start from someone with maybe, you know, seeing Canvas apps, seeing a little bit of the basics about Power Apps. But what we do is rather than trying to cover all of what the Power Platform can do, we break that down. And really today in this lab, we're just going to focus on Canvas app development. And so how do we work with data from within a Canvas app? How do we work with the components? And really, we just, like I said, strip away all of the data integrations and focus entirely within a Canvas app just so we can really learn all the bells and whistles without trying to introduce some of the more comp complexity that can come along from working with different data sources. And so where we're going to start is from a brand new Canvas app that we're going to create today. And so if you're not so familiar with the Office 365 ecosystem, you can access it from the Waffle. You can see Power Apps is here as well as Power Automate, the others. You can also access by going directly to make.powerapps.com. So if we go there, you'll see that it'll pull it up right for us. And so depending on where you're building these, if you have your own environment, I have my own here where I just started for diving into this lab, but just make sure that you're building somewhere that you do have permissions. And so, all right, jumping right in, we're not going to touch on so many of the different options that we have with Canvas apps. Again, Power Apps has so many different function pieces of functionality from building the model driven Canvas apps, Power Pages, we have AI Builder, right? So there's all of these different bells and whistles that we could start to look at and, and really get excited about. But like I said, to really hone in on developing our Canvas app capabilities and understanding how to build an app successfully and with quality, that's where we're going to hone in today. So even though we do have some of these options to integrate from existing data, we do have some of the other options. If we go to the create, Microsoft has a lot of different templates. I think these are super valuable for looking at for reference and maybe patterns, trying to break out some of the different patterns of how you do a sidebar or how do you do every other row of data, something like this, right? There's different ways that you can apply some of the cool features or functionality that you're interested in doing and that also your app needs if you try and take from these. But like I said, I'll typically use these as a frame of reference. I won't start with one of these apps. I'll, I'll still almost always build my own app from scratch. 
And so that's where for either from create or from the home screen, we'll create a blank app. We have the options here, like I was saying, power pages, Dataverse. We're still just going to create a blank canvas app. And I'll call this our request management. And a lot of times people will start in phone, maybe just by accident or just unintentioned, just trying to understand. There is a quirk that happens if you do start in phone and then you want to convert to a tablet where the resolution of everything you add will still be trying to format and then adjust from phone to tablet. And so if you are going to build what you would expect from a typical web application, right? If that's what you're aiming for, at least, then always start with the tablet because from tablet, you can make it responsive and nav and be able to account for a phone layout much easier than trying to have a phone account for a tablet layout. So request management app format is tablet. All right, and this is pulling up here. Okay, and so before we dive into throwing things down on the screen, let's just cover some of the features of the editor in case some of the viewers here just aren't so familiar. And so this is the modern command bar that Microsoft has been introducing in the last year, really trying to simplify what is here. So we have some of the different things of how we would get to settings, how do we get to different properties of the app, so where some of our data is stored. They're really, like I said, trying to streamline this so that it's easier and doesn't take up so much visual space. We don't use this necessarily, or I don't use this so much. I do like where it's coming along, but really I'll do most of my work in the property drop down here and the formula bar as well as the tree view and the properties panel here so let's dive into like i said the tree view where i typically almost always have this up what the tree view represents for a canvas app is all of the different screens that and components for that matter that represent your app there's also this important one that is in every canvas app which is called the app some of the integrations, so with Power BI or if we're embedding a Canvas app and a model-driven app, there are different components that you'll see here. And so rather than app, you'll see model form integration, which then has access to data that might be being passed into the Canvas app. And then same thing with Power BI. You're going to be able to pass data from Power BI into the embedded Canvas app, which is really cool. But if we're not doing those integrations, the Canvas app will then have this app always and some of the properties that you'll see on here, I'll come up to the properties combo box and you'll see start, size, on start. We're going to come back to this just in a second, this on start, on start. But for now, let's just know that it's there. Everything that's in this properties drop down is also here on the right hand side in the properties panel, as I'll refer to it. The properties panel is great for just seeing immediately quick references. So app name, right? You have these different properties that are dynamic to whatever you have selected. And so these are the properties for the app. If I switch to a screen, you'll see that it has its own properties as well. And so this will change based on whatever you have selected from the tree view. And on top of it, anywhere you are in the app, you'll see down here as well in this little breadcrumbs that'll start to appear. And so in the tree view, if I want to add something, that's where I'll switch to my insert panel. And if I open this menu up, you can see the names of these as well. We have tree view, insert, data, a few others here, but I'll keep that minimized for now. Everything that is on a screen is essentially a component that you can insert from either here or you can also insert it from up here. I kind of like this one just because I can keep the tree view open and then I can still see everything I need. Otherwise, it's fairly straightforward to switch back and forth. But if I did enter and insert a text label, you can see now if I switch back to tree view, this label one is inside screen one. You can also see that here in the breadcrumbs. And you can see that the properties panel has adjusted because we are selecting label one, which is of type label. And so everything that we can configure here, test management app, or rather request management app, I should say, will then automatically reflect here. And you can see as well, like I was saying, the properties drop down here is synchronized to everything here. So as I change that, now you can see the formula bar automatically updated. The one additional thing I'll say is if we work 
and get used to working in the formula bar for doing our functionality, that's where we're going to move to next because there's a lot of features that are built into the formula bar to help the user just understand how to essentially code a power app at the end of the day. And so let's just drag this up here. I'll drag this to go across the screen for the moment. And let's go back to the app on start. And so app, like I said, we'll go to the properties bar on start. And so like rather than take that back. Okay, so we're gonna go to the app on start. All right, and so like I was saying at the beginning, rather than trying to integrate with a data source here to start, instead we're just gonna bring in a kind of local copy of data that will just be contained within our app here. And so I'll provide this code separately, but this is what I'll be pasting in. So one great feature of the formula bar that I was explaining is the first most important thing that if Everything looks a little bit of gobbledygook in here, right? It's all kind of just pushed together, no spacing. If everything is formatted correctly, if the formula is valid, so to speak, then you'll be able to format text and you'll see everything now adjust. If we cannot, so for example, if I put a space here, now you can see that there's an error. I can't format this. If I hover over it, you can see there's issues because there's a space in this name. So if I take that back, now you can see all of the coloring came through, it's valid, and I can format text again. And so we can drag the property bar open as well, which just makes this so much easier. And now that it's formatted, it's actually a lot easier to also read as well. So I highly recommend taking advantage of the format text and trying to get used to what it looks like in this in this kind of organization. We're not gonna go too deep, but what we're doing here is we're setting a variable called domain name. This is looking at this user object and pulling out from the email the domain at the end of it. And so since I am Storm at Kumo Partners, that's what this record essentially references. And so I'm doing some string manipulation to just get everything after the at, which therefore is kumopartners.com. Right now, and this says blank at the moment because that variable hasn't been set, because we need to initiate that trigger that's causing that to set itself, right? And so that would be actually trying to run the application and have it trigger the on start. So if I open this app again, this will all trigger automatically, but I wanna be able to test that without having to close the whole editor and reopen that. And so if I come here, right click, or if I click the little ellipsis, you'll see that the app also has this run on start functionality. And so I'll go ahead and click that doesn't look like anything happened, but if I highlight the domain name again, boom, now we have our kumopartners.com. This is actually being populated. And so moving down to a, this piece down here, we're actually creating a collection of essentially static data. And so this collection is called request data. You can see here on top that we also get the IntelliSense explaining what is the parameters of this formula or of this function. And so since clear collect is a function, the first parameter of that is the collection. And essentially what it's looking for here is the name of the collection itself. After that, it says item, and you can see this is a record or a table. In this case, I can collect a table. This is just, again, it's another function, but it's a function that returns a table. And so something we're gonna be really hammering home as we go through this is you wanna make sure you're always following schema within a Power App. And so there's a lot of different schemas, and what, what do I mean by that? There's text, right? There's a number, there's a record, which is an object, or there's also a table. And a table can be a table of records with multiple properties, or it could just also be a table of single value string data. And so all of this needs to be, you need to be thinking about this, I should say, because as you interact and you're trying to move data around the app, remembering and being aware of what is the schema of the data you're working with is super important. And so in this case, you can think of request data as a table of records that have the schema of ID, requester, title, created. And you can see even all of this is being under, is understanding that, okay, created is a date. So because I'm passing the today function. And what does the today function return? It returns a date. 
And so then everything else is following that so it knows to be valid because all of these are being set to a date. So this gives us valid data without, like I said, us trying to focus so much on where is it coming from, how do we integrate it. Right now we just have a table of data called request data. Again, just the preview, just to really hammer this home. If you look down at the bottom, because it's valid and it was populated because we ran that on start, right? Now we can see all of this is filled out here. All right, so now that we have some data we can work with, let's try and bring that into the app. And so what we're gonna do is come here to layout. Actually, no, we're gonna come to, where did it go? Oops. We're not gonna insert a gallery just yet. On this first screen, we're actually going to just insert a data table. And so you'll see this is where I kind of, I was selected on this and so it wasn't letting me, or actually, excuse me, I was selected on app and so when I try to add data table, it's locked out because you can't add data table to the app. So once I click on screen, lo and behold, you'll see that it is now valid. So now that I have this data table here, what I can do is start to bring that data from what I set in that collection, right, request data, into this data table. And so when you're working with data and these components that interact with data, just to bring them up here, if I go to layout, you'll see we have galleries, different types of galleries, flexible height, I'll explain these in a second, and then we have this data table. So whenever you're working with these components, I should say almost 100% of the time, you have this property called data source, and this is where you're telling the component where the data is coming from. And so if we did look at you know, our different connectors, we could bring in SharePoint, we could go into all of these different ways to bring data, but you can also see we have our collection right here. So if I go ahead and just select that, that will now automatically connect that to my collection. So with the data table, what's really nice is it has this fields additional panel, if you will, and so I don't have any fields added, so let me go in. And now we can see all of those properties that I had right from the formula I was showing you in the beginning. So if I just select these, what's also nice is the order you select these in will also be the order it puts them in. Random fact, but worth thinking about. So I'll put ID, title, the requester, when it was created, status, and assign to. And so now you can see all of those got populated here and I now have my data table. And so this is where the data table I think is really convenient because it really is a pretty straightforward component to use. It does have some edge cases that make it a little trickier at times. If you're working with very large sets, tens of thousands of rows of data, this will have a little harder time trying to process that. But at the end of the day, if you just need a table of data without doing a lot of formatting and this, that, or the other, this is a perfect way to start. And so for a data table, you can see all of those fields we added, we have those columns right here. So each column has its own set of properties. You can see, does it grow? That means if can the user do this itself or does it lock in? Is it a hyperlink? And so when it's a hyperlink, you can now create a clickable behavior. And so if I hold alt, that's like I'm playing it, right? And so you can see now it's clickable where before it's still clickable, but it doesn't have that hover effect. So I'll unhold alt the same way I can also click play and then it's doing the same thing, right? I'll escape. And yeah, all of this is telling me is that I can hold alt. Okay. And so there's not too much more I want to do here to the data table. I just wanted to show you that this is a great way to start to just get the foundation of it down. Mm -hmm.